serious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations. Now by His Spirit, He has revealed it to His holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan, Paul writes. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body, and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving Him by spreading this good news. You notice the word grace used twice so far. And Paul has used the word grace already several times. Paul, throughout his writings, uses the word grace 92 times. 92 times he writes the word grace. And we've talked about grace before. But I want to pay, pay special attention today as we're going to talk about grace and what that means to us. And we're going to talk about grace versus the law. Grace can be described as this way. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a great way to remember God's grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. So what is grace? What is when we talk about grace versus law, someone give me a definition of what grace is. Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. That's the one I was looking for. I'm sorry? A great gift. It's a great gift. It's an unmerited gift. It's a gift that we do not earn. So God's grace equals unmerited favor. But the law is merited favor. I get blessed by what I do. But according to grace, we are blessed by what we believe. The law brings death, but grace brings favor. We're going to be going to the book of 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, and I wrote about it a little bit in the newsletter. And I want to pay special attention to this section of Scripture this morning. Because as we begin talking about grace, and as Christ once again becomes exalted in the churches, and a remarkable thing is beginning to happen around churches around America. I'm seeing more and more pieces of literature coming to me saying, we need to get back to preaching Jesus. We need to get back to preaching Christ. And that is exactly what we need to do. And that's what we have been doing here. We have been preaching Jesus. But I also want to give you a warning. That historically what happens when people come back to Christ, they don't stop there and legalism begins to creep in. And slowly but surely, we begin to think about all that Christ has done for us, and we think about the life that we want to live in Christ, and so then legalism begins to creep in, and then once again we begin to think that we're going to be saved by our works. We're going to be saved by the good things that we do. So this morning is kind of a, a preemptive strike, if you will, to say we are saved by grace, not by what we do. We are not saved by performance salvation. We're saved by grace and by grace alone. There is nothing else that comes into the picture other than grace. What Christ has done for us, God's riches at Christ's expense, unmerited favor. When Moses went up on the mountain, if we go back to the Old Testament, when Moses went up on the mountain, nobody had died. They wandered through the desert. Nobody died. Their shoes didn't wear out. When they complained, God did not strike them down. When they complained, they said, we're hungry. God gave them manna. Nobody died. We're thirsty. God brought water from the rock. Nobody died. But when the law was instituted, Death came, and on the day the law was instituted, 3,000 people died at the hand of sword because God's judgment began to fall on people when they did not follow the Lord's law. And so what happens is we kind of get the idea that, well, if we're going to be a holy people, then we've got to start doing this and this and this because God hates sin. Of course God hates sin. God hates sin so much 
He, had to, he is a just God. Somebody had to pay for all of our sin, and that person is Jesus Christ. That's how much he hates sin. He sent his own son to be the penalty for our sin. So the church needs to be careful that we do not fall back into the trap of we're going to be saved by what we do, which has kind of been the history of the church. We are not saved by what we do. We are saved by what Jesus already did for us. And we're going to explore that today. Grace brings favor, but the law brings death. The law focuses on what I do, but grace focuses on Christ finished work. So as we begin to lay this groundwork, we're going to go now to the book of 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. And this is going to be a, kind of a hard sermon this morning, so you're going to have to get your thinking caps on, you're going to have to kind of maybe get a pen out and write some of these, these things down, because this is a very important thing. There was a movement a few years ago to put the Ten Commandments on school properties, on public properties, in front of courthouses, and so on and so forth. I don't know if you remember that movement, but that movement was, was pretty widespread. Let's hear what Paul has to say about that. The old way, he says, in 2 Corinthians 3rd chapter, says this, the old way with his laws etched in stone. What is the law etched in stone? The Ten Commandments. Did Paul, I mean, did, did Moses etch anything else in stone? Only Ten Commandments. Everything else is written down. But the Ten Commandments were etched in stone. So I know this is what he's talking about. The old way with laws etched in stone led to what? <coughs> Death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. You remember when he went up on the mountain? And he was given the law, and when he came down, his face was glowing. And the people said, ah, oh, we can't look at you, we can't look at you. And they asked him to put on a veil. So Paul writes this, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading. What happened to Moses? Over time, that glory faded. It, it, it went away. He didn't have to wear the veil any longer, because it faded over time. Should we expect far greater glory under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life. In the old way, the law brought death. Well, that was glorious because it was God's law. But in the new life, the Holy Spirit gives life, and that's way more glorious. That's way better. That is, this, is a, this is a law that gives life. This is a way that gives life. The law brought death. But the new covenant, the covenant of grace, brings the Holy Spirit, which brings life. Verse 9. If the old way, which brings what? Condemnation. Was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? So here's the law. The law makes us wrong with God. When we look at the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And when we look at those, and we compare ourselves to those, what are we doing? We're condemning ourselves. Because you may not commit adultery, and you may not take the Lord's name in vain, and you may honor your father and mother, but the first time you tell a lie, guess what happens? The entire law is now on you because you're, you're guilty of, of, of committing every single sin in the law. Every single one of them. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he comes in grace and truth. He doesn't come bearing law. He already did that through Moses. John tells us that Jesus came in grace and in truth. There is a new way that's going to happen. And the old way brought condemnation. Con the old law condemned the very best of us because we were all guilty of one sin. But what does grace do? Grace saves the very worst of us. Amen. Right? It doesn't matter what we've done because grace comes in and makes us right with God, Paul says. In fact, the, he says, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? The law was there. You remember what Jesus said? He said, do not think that I have come to to uh, overthrow the law, or condemn the law, or replace the law, I have come to fulfill it. 
When Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. The old way was done. A new way has come. The new way is the way of grace. The good news of the scripture is grace has come. Amen. Can you imagine the burden of trying to live under the law? How many of you would like to have in your backyard a bunch of sheep? <laughs> you would like to slaughter them. Would you like to do that? Would you like, instead of coming to church, would you like to, well, once a year, come and bring and have a big uh, ceremony where, where a bull was going to be slaughtered and then a ram was going to be slaughtered and, and then another ram brought it to the wilderness? You want to keep that system going? You want a system where every time that you commit a sin, now you've got that sin weighing on you and you've got to go sacrifice the animal to, to make up for it? I mean, is that what you want? But it's been replaced, but we still judge ourselves by what we do. God doesn't judge us by what we do. God judges us by what has been done for us through Jesus Christ on the cross. Let's keep going. So if the old way has been replaced, what's glorious? How much more glorious is the new way which remains? How long? Forever. Since the new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold, Paul says. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away, he says. But the people's minds were hardened. Listen to what he says here. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. What does the Old Law do? The old law brings death. What does the old law do? The old law brings condemnation. And still to this day, when you read the old law, it condemns. It covers their minds so they can understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only how? By believing in Christ. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. Why haven't the people of Israel turned back to Christ? Why haven't they come and embraced the Messiah? Because they are involved in the old law, and when they read the old law, they can't see Christ. But that's so weird because the whole entire Old Testament refers to Christ. Jesus says that the scripture is about me, but when you don't know Christ, it's not revealed to you. Someday, and I hope it's very soon, the veil is going to be taken away and there's going to be a massive amount of people coming to Christ, a massive amount of Jewish people coming to Christ. But only till that veil is removed. They can't see it. That's what else he says. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, for the Lord is spirit, and whenever the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. We don't, we, don't, we don't live under the yoke of performance salvation. We don't live under the yoke of if I do right, I am blessed. If I do wrong, I am cursed. We live under the freedom of grace. Amen. Because of what Jesus has done for us, performance salvation is gone. <clears throat> salvation now comes by what we believe. Romans tells us we are justified by faith. We are not justified by keeping the law. We're not justified by keeping the Ten Commandments. We're not justified by looking at the law and trying to compare ourselves to it because when you compare yourself to the law, you condemn yourself. It's written in the book of Romans. Of Romans. Listen to what else he says. And the Lord, who is spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. When we are sin conscious, when we begin to think about sin, we become sin conscious. But when we think about Christ, we become Christ conscious. If you want to overcome sin in your life, don't dwell on that sin, dwell on Jesus. When we look at Christ, He is the one who changes us. If we have a habit that we want to break, don't focus on the habit. Because that's what you're going to be chained to. Focus on Jesus. He's the only one who can deliver. 
And the Lord who is spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. We are changed by Christ, not by doing good things. We're changed by right believing, not from right doing. We're changed by Christ. We, we've already proven to ourselves that we can't change ourselves. If we could, then, the law, then, then, then Christ died for nothing, Paul says. You want to know how you fall out of grace? The Bible tells us how to fall out of grace. You know how we fall out of grace? It's not by the things that we do. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians, the fifth chapter, fourth verse. Listen to this. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. And what does he say? You have fallen away from God's grace. That's how you fall away from God's grace. By your own performance. By trying to do everything yourself. By saying, I can do this. I'm going to make myself right with God by doing this or by doing that. I'm going to make myself right with God by taking the Lord's Supper. I'm going to make myself right with God by giving a tenth of my income or more. I'm going to make myself right with God by prayer. I'm going to make myself right with God by reading the Scripture. We don't make ourselves right with God that way. We have been made right with God by Christ. And what He has done for us is not based on the law. It's not based on what we do. It's been based on what has been done for us through Jesus Christ. Amen. I need a couple volunteers. A couple volunteers. Yeah, they, need to be, they need to be males. So, Craig, I need you as a volunteer. <laughs> Just, I need you as a volunteer. I would like for you to be the role of a lamb. You think you could be a lamb? Not very well. Okay. Not <laughs> not <laughs> so lambs don't stand up like right, buddy. Lambs are are uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I want you to be a priest. I have sinned. <laughs> I have sinned. So I'm going to bring my little lamb to the priest. So I bring my lamb to the priest, and he's without fault and without defect. <laughs> Believe it or not. And I know this is a stretch of the imagination. So if you were a little lamb, and you were male, and you were born without defect, and you were a good-looking lamb, your days were numbered. Things are not going to go well for you. In fact, things are going to be very bad for you. <laughs> So I would bring this lamb to the priest, and the priest would inspect it. So go ahead and look Craig over. Is the priest looking at me? Is the priest looking at me? He's looking at what? He's looking at the sacrifice. If he deems Craig to be a worthy sacrifice, I'm out of the picture. Because it's not about me, it's about the lamb. So then what I do is I come over to Craig and I do something called impute. I take my sin, and not impute, impute. <laughs> I lay my hands on this lamb and my sin goes into this lamb. This lamb's innocence now is imputed to me. I am now innocent. He is now guilty. Guess what's going to happen to this guilty? <laughs> He's dead. <laughs> Guess, what? Guess what? I walk away free. Because my lamb took my sin. And what did I do? I took his righteousness. This is what Jesus did for us. When he stood before Pilate, what did Pilate say? I find no fault in him. He was deemed to be worthy. And when Caiaphas said, gave him the nod to crucify him, what that said was, he can now be the lamb that's going to be sacrificed on our behalf. My sin went into Jesus. And what did Jesus give to me? 
His righteousness. That, my friends, is grace. I got something that I did not deserve. Righteousness. Why? Because I am the sinner. Christ got something He didn't deserve. My sin. He's going to die for my sin and then in the divine exchange, I get His righteousness. Thank you, gentlemen. You may sit down. The book of Hebrews tells us in the 10th chapter that Jesus' sacrifice was good once for all time. Right? If his righteousness, if, it, if my sin has been taken care of once for all time, guess what? His righteousness is then good once for all time. Once I have the righteousness of God, I am free from sin forever. Because I now have his righteousness. Friends, it's not going to go away. It's because you, you mess up. It's because you sin. It's not going away. The sin has been taken care of. We're not, yes, we hate sin. Yes, we want to avoid sin. But the only way we avoid sin is by looking at Christ. We don't get rid of sin by our own efforts. We get rid of sin by Christ. Suppose that you are a, a, a citizen from, I don't know, let's say Italy. And you wanted to become an American citizen. <coughs> and so you did become an American citizen. Do you think it's easy to give up that Italian dialect once you start speaking English? No. You think it's easy to give up all the Italian customs just because you've become an American? No. Even though you're American, you're kind of your heritage is Italian, and sometimes you still act Italian. We have been given sonship with Christ. But sometimes we act like human beings. But God's grace is there for us when we act like human beings. Someday we're going to stand before the King and the angels are going to line the streets of gold and we're going to be walking down the streets doing the kingly, queenly wave because we're sons of God by what Christ has done for us. Amen. Not your performance. His sacrifice. I was in a gas station in Valparaiso about a year ago. And I was in line and there was a, a couple of people there. A couple of kids. And they had three or four two liters of pop. They had candy. They had cookies. And they went to pay for their stuff. And guess what they used to pay for their pop and their candy and their gum and their cookies? Food stamps. Is that what food stamps was intended for? To buy these kids pop, candy, cookies? That's not what it's intended for. They misused the food stamp program. Does that mean the food stamp program still wouldn't buy their, their stuff? Still would, right? Even though it was abused. God's grace is not a license for us to sin. God's grace is there so that we can come to Him boldly. Will people abuse it? Yes, they will. Why? Because we are still human beings. But God's intent for grace is to bring us into relationship with Him so that we can be blessed and have our lives poured out with blessing because of what He has done for us. Grace <coughs> brings favor. Law brings death. And so as we think about the years to come, just remember, we want to be people of grace who look to Jesus for our salvation and not to ourselves. If you look into some of the old hymn books, and if somebody's got a hymn book, maybe they can grab one. This is not a new idea. Look at some of these, these hymns that have been written in the past. Just, just grab any of these, and you start looking through some of these uh, old songs. Um, 
get to the grace section here. Um, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. This is written a long time ago. This is not new theology I'm bringing you today. It's theology that's been around for centuries. But we need to be reminded that we're saved by grace. We're not saved by what we do. We're saved by what has been done for us. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. By God's word at, at, at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. All oh, the love that drew salvation's plan, oh the grace that brought it down to man, oh the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. See, these old writers, they had it right. We're saved by grace. It's not a new idea. It's been around forever. What I want to teach you today, we're not saved by what we do. We're saved by what we believe. We are justified by faith that comes from the belief that Jesus paid the price on the cross. We gave him our sin. He gave us his righteousness. The song we're going to sing this morning is going to be nothing but the blood of Jesus. And today I want to pray for you, but as, as Karen comes forward and Janet comes forward, I just I want to pray for you. If you have something in your life that you've been holding on to that you've been fighting with for years, maybe you've got a sin, maybe you've got a habit, maybe you've got something in your life that has, made, that has kept you in prison. We're talking about freedom today. But if you have something in your life that's kept you in prison, you, you get freedom from Christ. So I want to pray for you today that, that it, as you stand, if you would just, if there's something that you want to leave at the Lord's feet, some, some, something that you've just been holding <coughs> on to, I, I, I just want you to leave it at the Lord's feet. Would you please stand and I'm going to pray for you. Father, through your Son, you've given us freedom. We're not bound to the law that condemns. We've been freed by your Son and what he's done for us on the cross. And Father, we still look to ourselves for our own salvation. We keep thinking that I can do it, I can do it, I can free myself from this, I can free myself from that. I can make things better with my husband. I can make things better with my wife. I can make things better at work. I can overcome this habit. I can, I can do better at watching what I say. I can do this and I can do that, but we know that we can. We know that our salvation comes from you and what your Son has done for us. And so, Father, today, as, as we come before you, if there's someone here that just needs to lay a burden at your feet, lay lay a sin at your feet, lay, lay our lives at your feet. It's because you want to bring freedom to us. You don't want us to be a slave. You want us to have the freedom that comes only from you. So Father, I just pray for anyone here today that just needs to let something go. You would give them the freedom to know that you love them, you care for them, you have their best interest. Father, your good news is that grace has come through Jesus. It's his name we pray these things. Amen.